Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Natasha Diaz has been a quarter finalist in the Austin Film Festival and a finalist for the Sundance Episodic Story Lab. Her personal essays have been published in The Establishment and The Huffington Post. Color Me In is her powerful debut coming-of-age novel about the meaning of friendship, the joyful beginnings of romance, and the racism and religious intolerance that can both strain a family to the breaking point and strengthen its bonds. Let's join Caitlin Whalen in conversation with author Natasha Diaz. Hi, Natasha. Welcome to Books Connect Us. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about how or why you became a writer? I think writing's always been a huge part of my life. Uh, Both of my parents are are writers. Um, My mom's a playwright and my father's a poet. And so words and reading and writing were always just really ingrained into my life. And as an only child without a sibling or someone else in the household who was my age, I really turned to writing as a way to process my feelings. Um, And so um, it really, it's always just come naturally to me. And I think it took me a while to, to have the confidence to try to pursue it as a career. And we're so glad that you did, because as I mentioned, you're the author of Color Me In. Can you tell our listeners what that story is about? Yeah, Color Me In is a coming-of-age young adult contemporary novel about a 14-going-on-15-year-old named Nevaeh Levitz, who is a biracial, white-presenting Jewish young woman. She's half Black and half white, and she is currently sort of straddling her two worlds between her white Jewish uh, community and her black Jamaican community and her parents are separating so she's trying to figure out where she fits between those two worlds. And I always love to ask when an author tells me about a coming-of-age novel what exactly does coming-of-age mean to you? It can mean so many different things but I wonder if it has particular meaning in your case. Well I think with regard to the book, I I was trying to be pretty literal um, in that. So she's being forced to have a belated bat mitzvah, which in um, the Jewish tradition usually happens when you're 13 years old. And in this case, she did not have a bat mitzvah. She's not really been practicing in the religion. And this is sort of the first time that that's being incorporated into her life. And so she's 15 going on 16. And that's a sort of a coming of age ceremony. And so in this context, I was trying to be sort of literal in the sense that, you know, she's just a, she is just a young adult coming into herself, but she's actually going through a formal process in which you sort of take accountability for becoming more of a young adult and coming of age in that way. And so um, when it came to the book, I was trying to put her through as many uh, lessons that would allow her to come out on the other side as a more informed and accountable young adult person. And you did that for the readers too. I have to say through my reading of it, I was like, oh my goodness, I am learning more about myself. I'm remembering all the things I went through when I was in high school trying to decide who I would become. And it's a really incredible experience getting to see what Nevaeh goes through because she is asking all these big questions. Who am I? Who do I have the right to be? And how do I claim that? And it was a really powerful journey to get to go along with her. And I'm curious too, did you have a specific reader in mind when you were writing her story? You know, I sort of had a younger version of myself in mind when I was writing um, because you know, I, it is uh, loosely based off my own experience being a multiracial white presenting Jewish woman um, who came from an, an interracial family, a multi ethnic family, um, interfaith family. Uh, I never really saw all of those different identities in one person on a page growing up. And um, it's, it can be lonely and it can be confusing. And so I wanted to write the book I wish I had had. Um, But in terms of readership now, I, I I don't ever, I, I always find it strange when writers or anyone really speaks as though YA is um, the type of literature you get within the YA world is somehow less than. I, I, I think that 
as an adult, I enjoy reading YA sometimes more than adult fiction, just because I find it's, it's more nuanced and it's also more real than I think adult, I think adult literature takes itself too seriously sometimes. And so I I was really just writing this book for anyone who wanted to read a story about figuring out who you are and being proud of who you are. And I don't think that that is restricted to any age group or any specific group of people. I think I, I'd be surprised to find out that there was anyone who has never at some point in their life thought like, how can I be the best version of myself? When you first started writing this book, can you remember that maybe the first moment of inspiration, the first, maybe the character's name came first or there was a scene that came first? Well, in some ways, I, f- I feel like I was writing this book my whole life <laughs> because, um, again, it is so it, it is so rooted in my experience, um, even though it's fiction. Um, but in terms of this of this, what ended up being the final version of the book, I think um, the opening, the, the prologue, uh, the moment where um, Nevea is younger than she is for the rest of the book. And it's a memory of her being at the playground with her mother and her mother is black and she is biracial, but she looks white and someone, uh, another mother come, comes over and asks if her mom, if Nevea's mom is her nanny And Nevaeh gets really upset because it's happened before and she's confused because she's young and she doesn't understand why anyone would would not know that that was her mother. Um, And that that was real, that's as, that's the the part of the book that's probably as close to biographical. Um, And so I always had that memory uh, in my head as as something that I would want to use to tell this story about this experience, and so I, I think that's probably the um, the scene that that I would say has always stuck with me that I wanted to make sure I could incorporate. And one thing I'd love to talk to you about today, because it's such a big part of the story and her identity, is all the intersections between her biracial identity and her religious identity. Mm-hmm. And my first question for you on that vein is what unique characteristics or realities of multiracial identity did you most want to convey through Nevaeh's story? Yeah, I wanted to just talk about how um, when you are multiracial, biracial, um, it, it's really confusing because so much of interpersonal relationships and also just the way people are perceived are, um, it's, it's projected onto you, right? So if you look a certain way, people are going to assume that that is all of who you are. And if they can't place you or um, they don't feel comfortable with that perception, you are then made to feel like it's your job to make them feel comfortable or to make them understand or to make them believe you. And what that does is it makes you feel like you don't have a right to be who you are oftentimes. Um, And so I wanted to speak to that specifically because um, when you are deemed ambiguous or um, other, it's dehumanizing um, and it can be really tricky to grow up with that feeling of being unsure of who you are. All that to be said that oftentimes if you are multiracial or biracial and also light-skinned or white presenting, which not all people who are biracial or multiracial are, but if you are, you have all of those confusing feelings and um, thoughts but you also have a lot of privilege and um, it, it can be really easy, I think, to stick to that first part of your identity, your internal debacle, your confusion, your feeling unsure and, and stay there and never really move on to also tackling your privileges and the ways that you may experience the world differently than the communities you are a part of because of how you look and because of that ambiguity. And it was important to me to talk about both of those things 
in hopefully as balanced way as possible. Because for me, what I came to understand as I got older was because I'm white presenting, I experienced the world with a lot of privilege that many of my family members and many of people in my life who are visibly of color, they, they don't have those privileges that doesn't take away from my right to be a member of the community, but it does mean that it's different. And that doesn't discredit who I am or my membership to the community, but it does mean that I have to take accountability for that privilege and make sure that that is not, um, I don't sweep that under the rug because it's so easy to to go into my feelings of being unsure or confused. Um, it, it's important to, to tackle both of those issues. And so I, that was my goal with the book was to make sure that, that I didn't leave the privilege part out of it because when I have read books, both as a young person as an, and as an adult that does focus on the biracial or multiracial identity, I rarely find that the, the privilege aspect, if that is the um, characters, the way they look, if that truly is a part of their experience, that never gets talked about. And it's so, for me, it's inherent. I can't talk about my multiracial identity without talking about the fact that I look so white because um, they, they're they intertwined. And so um, I wanted to, to make sure to add that layer to the conversation. When it comes to your own experiences, do you kind of remember how you got to a point where you could stand up and say, this is who I am, this is my identity? Was it something that was ingrained in you as you were raised, or is it something you came upon in your own coming-of-age real-life experiences? Um, yeah, it, it's funny because I um, I feel like I I grew up sort of on the fa- the farther end of like really proclaiming who I was from a young age, and it the lesson that I uh, had to learn, which is another one of the lessons that Nivea learns. She's sort of having to do it all at once. Whereas I, I, from a very young age was having these conversations with my family and figuring this out. But, um, I was very comfortable with my background. And what I had to learn was that because of my privilege, because of the way I look, sometimes I had to learn how to shut up about it sort of, and let the people in my community who um, are more marginalized because of the way they look, because they don't have that white presenting privilege, that their voices need to be amplified and I can use the um, power of my placement in the community, but also my ability to enter into other er- other communities where they may not be as welcome, I can use that power to, to help them bridge that gap. And uh, so really learning when to use my voice, when to make myself and my voice the centerpiece, and when to actually close my mouth and let someone else take that spot and take the mic from me. Um, because it's so often going to be handed to me because in white spaces, which, you know, as we all know, encompass the majority of places of power, um, they're going to be more comfortable handing the microphone to me because they can relate to me because we look similar. And so the message coming from me uh, can be easier for them to take. And I don't think conversations when it comes to race, when it comes to prejudice, should be comfortable. And we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be bending to that. We should be pushing ourselves into discomfort so that we can grow. And the best thing that a lot of times people like me can do is, is bridge the gap and allow members of our community who are not welcomed in those spaces to take our place. Another thing I'd love to talk to you about is Nevea's relationship with her parents in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, you can tell through the story that their histories and their stories as they recently separated, really weighs heavily on Nevea as she tries to figure out what side of the family she fits more in with, where she feels more welcome um, and a part of things. How do you think that influenced Nevea's relationship with her parents and how she saw herself, their two different stories and the ways she interacted with both of them differently? Yeah, I think, so when I was writing um, the book, uh, I hadn't yet become a parent. I wasn't pregnant or anything, but I was sort of reflecting on the way that 
I held my parents to an almost impossible standard in the sense that like they were my parents. And so I expected them to like do everything right all the time. And that's not a fair expectation. Obviously when parents make mistakes, I think they need to be held accountable for those mistakes and need to be able to both apologize for them and, and correct them. But we also have to remember that everyone's just a human, right? And we're all going to make mistakes. And so as I was writing the book, I, I wanted Nevea to, as she was working on herself and really recognizing her own mistakes, I also wanted her to see um, the ways that she was not giving her parents slack in their own ability to be humans and make mistakes. And without giving too much away, you know, one of them makes mistakes that sometimes you can't come back from and it was a it was a lesson that i think i've learned as an an adult but i think younger people should be aware of the fact that sometimes it doesn't matter who the person is in relation to you it's also okay to walk away from someone who's toxic to your life even temporarily i think that's a really hard lesson to learn but it's an important one. And so I, I just, I wanted her to, you know, this is a, it, I wanted it to feel real and real life is messy and hard and um, it can also be wonderful and beautiful, but it, it doesn't help anything if, if the story is sugar coated um, or, you know, we just get a happy ending because that's what we want because that's not what's going to happen in the real world and i wasn't writing fantasy i was writing contemporary so that was um it, it was important for me for for that to be as messy as it can be in the real world kind of speaking about not sugarcoating things um and finding the beauty and the pain something i really loved about nevea was her writing um in the story, you really beautifully blend, you know, what's happening in the narrative and then jumping right into a piece of her own writing, your poetry. And it really gives you this kind of insider look into her head, not in just what's happening, which is a lot of the rest of the story, but in how she feels about it. Even if she's not saying, I feel sad, I feel happy. You get this totally different tone when you're in her writing. How did that find its way into the book? How did her as a writer find its way into being such a big part of her character and how she processed what was happening around her? I'm imagining it slightly based on your own experiences. Yeah, yeah, I know I said earlier, um, you know, I really turned to writing when I was young to process my feelings. And so I wanted to share that. I wanted the character, the main character to, to share that with me. Um, and part of it too is, you know, as I said before, one of the big things she figures out is sort of the power of her voice and how to find her voice up until this point in her story. When we meet her, she's always sort of felt invisible and like, because she's so confused about who she is and, and what her identity is, she's really just closed, closed herself up. And so her writing is, is a peek into how she's feeling and her processing what's going on because she doesn't yet have the tools to communicate that outwardly. And so the, the hope was throughout the book, when we see the poetry, it's really like you're crawling inside of her brain and you're hearing her thoughts. And at the end, uh, again, hopefully without giving too much away, she's performing that. And so it's not, you're actually, you are actually hearing her thoughts, but she's telling them to you instead of you sneaking into her brain. And so you go from, from being uh, inside her to being outside of her and hearing her voice, having gone through the journey of, of not feeling comfortable saying it out loud to then doing so. That's a really rewarding moment when readers do get to that point in the story. And it is so exciting to see her put her voice behind those words. And thinking about process, I'm curious, when you had her writing, were those pieces something that came to you separate from writing the actual narrative from point A to point B? Or did they all kind of flow together one at a time? Yeah, the first couple drafts, the poetry wasn't in the book. Uh, and it was not as good of a book. <laughs> <laughs> it was missing. It was, it was um, missing it. And so when I finally um, decided to, tr to try to incorporate that, um, it, it really breathes life into the story in a lot of ways. Um, but it also, um, 
what I found was it added this extra layer to her to her journey um, as because as I was saying you're you're in her brain I think a lot of what I was having difficulty with was was when you're writing a character who has difficult time communicating it's hard to to put that on the page because then they're they're really not saying very much <laughs> and so this was my <laughs> way of um, giving her a voice when she didn't yet have one. So we've talked a lot about the really impactful and inspirational and empowering themes and components that you've put into this book. I'd also like to talk a little bit about joy and maybe hear about a joyful moment in your writing and publishing process that you could share with us. Honestly, there's not one, but I've been so uh, grateful to receive messages uh, from readers, whether uh, they're young or adults. Um, people reach out to me on Instagram and through my website and just send me messages telling me that uh, reading Color Man is the first time that they saw themselves in a book. And knowing that that is true, it makes me a little bit sad because it's 2020. And so... <laughs> <laughs> this should not be the first book that does that, but I am so proud that it it does. And um, I hope it opens the door for more uh, stories like this to be told so that uh, this is not the only book where the, these readers do see themselves. Um, but getting those messages is always uh, such a heartwarming and um, wonderful feeling to know that the book has touched uh, anyone in that way. It really has. I'm a biracial woman reader. And when I read this book, I called my mom <laughs> and I said, I'm seeing things that meant the world to me. So it really is a gift when writers like you take such personal experiences and share so much of that on the page through fiction so that others can see themselves. And it's that sense of validation that I talk about with my reader friends that when you see something on the page you can relate to, it gives you this feeling of I have a right to be. Do you have any advice for teen writers who are looking to tell their own stories through fiction? Yeah, I mean, do it. We need we need your story and your voices and uh, now more than ever, really. And um, it can be really scary, I think, to take your personal experiences and put them out there. And what's amazing about doing so through fiction means you can take the feelings and um, you can take what's inside of you and then you can translate it into something that's made up so that it, you are giving yourself a layer of distance from it. So you're not having to write your biography. You don't have to talk about every experience you've been through, but you can take your experiences and translate them in a way that can really be relatable to a larger group of people and will also help so many people, especially even if they are your exact, have your exact background and experience, because even if you translate it into um, a bit of a more broad theme, it, it'll, it'll reach the people who need it. So don't push past the fear of having to be so vulnerable because it, it's really rewarding and it, it'll be healing for you too, but it'll really, it'll be really impactful for the people who need it, who need to read it. I am silently cheering for you in the background of all of that. I know our <laughs> listeners can't see that, but absolutely. Yes. I think that is some great advice for teen writers listening out there. Uh, these days, what have you been reading or what other writers have inspired you to keep your writing going? So I am reading Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson, who is a genius. Her books are incredible. Get all of them immediately. She actually, uh, I'm very fortunate to call her a friend, actually. But she, before I met her, she pulled me out of a really deep uh reading slump. Reading has always been one of my favorite things to do. And after my cat died a few years ago, I couldn't read. I just couldn't read. I was so sad and depressed. And I finally picked up uh, Monday's Not Coming, which is her second book. And it, I got so into it that halfway through it, I stopped reading and I ordered Allegedly, which was her first book. But because I need it, I was like, oh my God, whatever she writes, I want to read. And so um, I, I, before even finishing the first book, I, I ordered another one of hers and, and she's just so 
brilliant. So I'm, I'm loving it. And I'm trying to save her. I mean, I don't have a lot of time to read right now because I have a baby, but when I have a moment, I am so enjoying grown. So my last question for you is how can your readers connect with you? Yeah. So I have an, a website with a contact page. So the website is Natasha Erica with a K E R I K A Diaz at dot com. <laughs> DrEricaDiaz.com. Yeah. Um, And then uh, I'm on Twitter at Tashi Diaz. And I have an Instagram, which is Natasha Erica Diaz. Well, everybody out there, go ahead and give Natasha a follow, reach out with her website. And is there anything else you wanted to share with listeners today on Books Connect Us? Just be kind to yourselves. Right now is a rough time. And things are going to take a while to settle. So be kind to yourself. Let yourself do nothing if you need to. And if you want to be productive, great, but don't beat yourself up if you can't. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for all of your time today and everything you shared with us. And it was a pleasure getting to talk with you today, Natasha. You too. Thank you so much. And now, here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. I have lived trapped in that moment ever since, in the dreaded ambiguity that follows me everywhere I go, even here, in this grimy mirror and bitter fluorescent glow. The electric hiss, like bees caught in a plastic casing, sends shock waves from the sterile light bulbs in the bathroom of Mount Olivine Baptist Church. The sound travels over the damp off-white tiles, back to my reflection in a mirror so streaked and blurred with soap scum, my skin almost blends into the walls behind me. If it weren't for the burst of brown freckles that swarm around my nose and across my cheekbones, I'd be the way I am most of the time, invisible swallowed up whole by the imaginary bugs and the all-encompassing beige. Cloudy Pepto-Bismol pink gel squirts onto me like projectile vomit from the rusted soap dispenser and sends a foamy streak across my light yellow shirt. I go to grab a handful of waxy paper towels piled up on the side of the sink and bump my phone and church program, which I've covered with poetry scribbles, sending them to the ground. Damn it! My shout echoes through the empty space, and I stand with my eyes pinched shut, ready for Jesus Christ to float into the ladies' room and smite me for using foul language in his house. But no one comes. The organ upstairs begins to play, accompanied by the choir. They drag these hymns out for like 20 minutes. Four sentences that repeat over and over and over, gaining in volume and excitement and conviction with each go-around. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. There to be baptized. This is the song before closing remarks. I need to get moving before the Grey Lady Gang rushes in here for their weekly gossip session, which, for the record, is way scarier than the reincarnation of the Lord and Savior. Every Sunday, the posse of 80 to 100-year-old ladies shows up in matching skirt suits and refined wigs, ready to talk shit and bully folks in the name of Christ. The whole congregation knows that they kick out anyone who dares use the bathroom during their regularly scheduled meeting with a swat of a cane and a glare so rigid that their victim is liable to cross over right here in the bathroom. Did you see what she had the nerve to wear today, Eveline? She's a two-bit hussy, if you ask me, stuffed into that getup like a breakfast sausage. Their raspy voices rush under the bathroom door with the breeze from the fans in the hallway. I'm too late. Currently, the talk of the town is Miss Clarice, a woman in her 60s who owns a clothing boutique that specializes in form-fitting, outlandish attire best reserved for 90s Lil' Kim videos. 
She is back on the prowl for love after her fling with Pastor Davis ended abruptly a few weeks ago. The Grays threatened to circulate a petition for his retirement, deeming it inappropriate for a community leader to be seen with her in public. Miss Clarice isn't exactly helping her case, showing up to church every Sunday in outfits so tight it's a miracle when she doesn't pop right out of them. Their murmurs move closer, so eager to dive into the juicy updates that they can't even wait to get inside the room. The pounding from their thick heels against the floor counts down to our impending face-off. I have to save myself. I burst through the door just before they arrive and walk past them without making eye contact as I rush to the stairs. Hmm, huh, grunts the oldest and roughest GLG member, Miss Eveline. Her straight, chin-length black wig sways ever so slightly under a wide-brimmed lavender hat adorned with netting and an embroidered silver rose. They can't be satisfied taking our houses. Now these white folks got to come up here into our churches, too. Aretha, a light-skinned woman who is the tallest and sprightliest in the bunch, asks. Miss Eveline smacks Aretha's hand with a guttural, Shush! That there is Nevea, Pastor Pear's granddaughter, Miss Eveline says. The Jewish one, I hear before the bathroom door closes behind them with a sharp click. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.